This recording is but just a continuation of my initial coverage on excretion. So before, I did mention that there are two main routes of excretion. Those are renal and biliary excretion, whereas other sites are not impossible. I mean, they can happen, but it's not really as common as those first two. And that is also under the assumption that many of the common drugs being discussed in introductory pharmacology courses are really excreted via those two mentioned routes. Now, what else do we need to know? Here, probably a little of the finer details. So first, in my first coverage in my, in my uh, previous video, I mentioned that two out of the three main processes in the kidney successfully get rid of our drugs to the outside environment. Those are filtration and active tubular secretion. Just to clarify, filtration is more or less a passive process. And here, since really we're just going with the flow of the urine and assuming that not all of our unionized molecules can successfully go back because there is a direction of the urine, right, from inside our body, it goes throughout the genital urinary tract and then to the outside. Even, even an ionized molecules can just you know, go with the flow and be flushed out. So as long as they are um, small enough, then they could go out. But actually, uh, actually in active tubular secretion, here it should be something similar to our facilitated transport back then, that the only drug molecules or metabolites that can undergo this process are a selected few. For example, some penicillins, which are very common antibiotics. And really for our uh, fundamental or basic discussion, we won't really need so far to deal with these special cases. Okay, now, in the previous video, I also mentioned that the absorption is possible from the kidney back to the liver. And uh, the, well, basically the systemic circulation that is. And what I wasn't able to mention is that there's also another form of return or reabsorption that can happen. And what is that? It is actually possible that let's say we have some of our, um, some of our drugs in the GI tract or the blood, and they are in the liver. There is a possibility that our molecules that go here will just re return unscathed or unharmed or undeactivated. So meaning that they could go back to our body, our systemic circulation still working. And therefore, such process is called enterohepatic recycling. Hepatic, of course, having to do with the liver and recycling, meaning that it's, you know, it's their fate is supposed to be uh, decided in this route, but they got recycled, meaning they go back here. And of course, it can go to the blood and it can go to the bar body and do its effect. And also, just like what I mentioned here, enterohepatic recycling is quite a special case and will happen to only a selected few drugs, so few that you'll probably be asked to memorize them by your teacher. Now, what is the implication of this? Well, of course, since we assume that the molecules will already say goodbye, but then they are recycled, meaning they are still alive, that means they have a tendency, I mean, if this happens to a drug molecule, it has the tendency to increase the duration of action. So whenever there are drugs that are mentioned that you know, undergo hepatic, enterohepatic recycling, this is the most common and most uniform implication of that. Now, another thing, of course, we should remember that back then, a few videos back, we did mention the pharmacokinetic plots. And we learned that there will always be a minimum effective and a minimum toxic concentration. And we only want our dose to be within this, which is now what we call as the therapeutic window. Because of course, we remember, we should remember that anything below the minimum effective is not going to do anything. And anything beyond the minimum toxic is going to be harmful. We neither want um, no effect nor harm. We want the therapy, uh, therapeutic effect. So this is like the therapeutic window that we uh, described. 
And we know that not all the time, our drug will reach the therapeutic window. Now, what will be the problem if I only take a single dose? Well, naturally, if you only take one tablet of something, it will give you a benefit for its duration of action. But once it drops below the MEC once again, then its effect ceases to take place in the body. That is why we remember it is usual for a patient, for us, to when we are given medications, we take them several times a day and sometimes at uniform uh, time intervals. Because in our body, what sort of what what what's supposed to happen if we are kind of uh, really in time and prudent with our schedule of doses is that once you know we we take our first tablet and then we know that the speak will go down. If we time it properly, uh, like we take our second tablet here. It will peak somewhere here and it will somehow keep the drug concentration afloat. Because if we don't take the second drug um, at the right time, then this will already drop below the minimum effective concentration, just like here. But by prudently taking our medication at equally spaced intervals, you can see this violet coloring right here, that if we have such therapeutic window like this, you will see that we are keeping it somehow constant or steady. And this phenomenon of maintaining our blood drug concentrations at this steady level, okay, by taking our doses appropriately is, of course, what we call the steady state.